Welcome to Toffee TV. Now, we're on the verge of another World Cup. We all love World Cups, and Simon Hart really, really, really loves World Cups. He is the author of the brand new book, World in Motion. It's all about the 1990 World Cup, Italian 90, which it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange World Cup for lots of reasons. But, Simon, why did, why did you decide to write this book? Um, it, would you say it's a strange World Cup? It's it's probably seen as the most influential, uh, pivotal World mm. Cup um, by many people because of what it meant to English football. Um, I suppose ushering in a new a new era, really. Um, in the broadest brush strokes, on the back of Gaza crying, you <laughs> might say. Um, I know we'll fill in the gaps as yeah. we go along, um, but also the rule changes that, that followed it because it was the lowest scoring World Cup. You know. It was seen as a very negative yeah. kind of moment in football, the way football was played. Um, geopolitically, it was the last World Cup for many of the Eastern European teams as they were, because the Iron Curtain was coming down. And um, I suppose for, for Black Africa, it was a, a big, big deal, because Cameroon, mm. you know, no, no sub-Saharan African nation had ever won a World Cup game. Cameroon go along and beat Argentina in the first game, the holders and reach the, the quarterfinals and yeah. probably should have beaten in England. So yeah. there's so many places where I wanted to find out what it meant, you know, in, in, not just in England, but around the world. Um, the USA, their first World Cup since 1950, a big yeah. deal there, you know, because mm. it, it started that, pro, you know, the, the process with, um, they hosted it four years later yeah. and the MLS yeah. was set up. So l many places, you know, it, it had a big impact. Yeah, yeah. Well, cause I would say when I say st strange, it's because it, it it almost feels like it, when you say pebble, that's right. It's it's the big, it's the end of the old and the beginning of the new for so many reasons, like so many you've just um, you've just mentioned there. So you you went out and interviewed a lot of players. I mean, how many how many trips did you have to make, and how many players did you go and see? And um, there's about just over 100 interviews for the book. Um, 11 countries, four continents. So it was quite a a big process. Um, sort of organising it all and then writing it up, um, a lot of transcribing. Um, but I went to Cameroon, uh, which was I suppose the biggest trip, yeah. um, ended up in Roger Miller's house, which is something I never thought I'd <laughs> expect to be saying. Um, in his driveway there was a fan in a Liverpool shirt sweeping, oh. uh, sorry to, to, to drop that one. Um, <laughs> but uh, so Cameroon was a big trip, you know, could they were, you know, they, they were Romantic's favourites mm. of that tournament. and. Uh, I met Benjamin Massing, um, who sadly passed away now, but he's the man who, who took out Canegia uh, famously. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. The the greatest World Cup foul of all time. So uh, he was a, a real in a real gentle giant. He was. Um, so just some brilliant encounters like that um, in Italy. I met uh, uh, Toto Scalacci in, in Palermo. You know who was the, you know the, the, the Italian the one, hero. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he now, now looks younger than, than he did then. Several hair transplants later, <laughs> he could have passed the surgery, allegedly. Um, so, I mean, I'm just trying to, what, what else could I, could I tell you about? Um, Eastern Europe, I went to um, to Russia um, to find out, you know, what, a little bit about how their lives were changing. Mm. I met a player called Kidia Tulin, who, at the time he was playing for Toulouse in France because players had just started to be allowed to leave the Soviet Union yeah, yeah. and he was getting paid $30,000 a month and he had to go to the Russian embassy every month and give 29000 to the to the ambassador because otherwise he'd have been earning more than the ambassador and the Russian state wouldn't allow that. So loads of little kind of funny stories yeah, about yeah. you know what, what it was like back then. Um, so yeah, lots of trips and uh, lots of good anecdotes. It's it's as I say it was um, we we watch football now and we we like to think we know everything about it, but you know going to my day the first game Argentina versus Cameroon the the world champions versus a you know a country we knew nothing about, and then suddenly you know they win the game and then Roger Miller explodes onto the scene and. It, it it was like that, wasn't it? You know, you mentioned Scalacci, a play that was hardly known in his own country, mm -hmm. and yet he was introduced to the world, and we were we were we we embraced him, um, like like they embraced him, and it, there's so many of those little things. The Republic of Ireland, that was such a huge story as well. Everywhere you looked, there was just pockets of stories that made it just so interesting and so you know, uh, and and you know, 
books like this, you those stories only starting to begin to be getting told because obviously people have finished their careers and uh, and and are starting to. I suppose it'd be allowed to start releasing the anecdotes because for so long a lot of them wouldn't 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 dare because of their teammates or or you know political things as you said. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, I mean, the at one place the dimension was Argentina, uh, where I, I went in November, and you're right. There's the certain stories that they had, which <laughs> they're just about starting to confirm that it's true. Because the famous one with when Branco, the Brazil defender, drank from the, the dodgy water bottle in in that in the second round game they had um and he claimed immediately after the game that it, it was spiked um and so i i sat down with a couple of their players and w- one of them Alata Coachea um he sort of it, it he basically said yes <laughs> uh, it was spiked uh so there were these stories which are coming out uh, that the uh, the Argentinian goalie Goicochea um he had a pee on the pitch before the penalty shootout against Yugoslavia because um, he'd been drinking loads of water. It was a hot day in Florence and he wasn't allowed to go to, back to the, the dressing rooms. Uh, and so but they, they then have another shootout in the semi finals. And he, he just for super, superstition this time, he <laughs> thought, same you know, thing. I'll, I'll crouch down and I'll, you know, as you do in the middle of a, a World Cup match. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, not, not as bad as what Gary Lineker done, though. He did something worse on the pitch, if I remember. Uh, he, he, yeah, yeah. He had a That's not cool. stomach cramp. He said, yeah. and uh, but he ended up like being looking like a dog, basically. So you can all picture that. Um, how do you remember it yourself, like at the time? Yeah, um, I mean, I I remember I was seventeen then. Um, so I mean, we were talking before about Spain '82 as being kind of the first World Cup where uh, uh, it really kind of yeah. registered what it meant. But uh, the World Cup was just brilliant I think for our generation because um, we, we didn't have wall-to-wall mm. football on the telly um, we didn't know most of these players I mean there were only two two foreign players based in the English top flight who played in that World Cup yeah uh, who were you know Glenn Hussain and Roland Nielsen so everyone else you, you're just trying to f- you're finding out who these are there, there was not a single live European game European Cup, a UEFA Cup game on British telly that year, mm-hmm. that season leading up to it, and there were only twelve. Sorry, sorry to throw stats to you, but no, just to give, just to give you a bit of context, we only twelve top flight live games. So we weren't used to seeing live football for a yeah, start, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and we weren't used to seeing all these yeah. play, people with funny names. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just so exciting, and it was presented as well, wasn't it, in such a way that obviously kicked on to when Channel 4 took because because people just loved it it started with um, Pavarotti singing you know Nessun at Dorme. the Nessun Dorme at the beginning of it that, and then to see those I mean I remember seeing like the San Siro and just being like what, what is that's not a football stadium that is that's something more and I remember just being captured by all those things because we were used to the mundane the European band was on so we weren't seeing much of, of European football as you just mentioned and even just the way the graphics was presented, I remember the graphics coming down the side and then like going down the side and into the middle. And it was just, it, everything was just like, this is this is something else. That's just even the thing took me back to uh, a computer game, yeah. the Italian 91. That was the, the box, was basically obviously the, the mascot. But uh, when you were saying there, the opening game, you know, Argentina against um, Cameroon. Cameroon. You can just remember it, that the, you know, the header, the keeper should save Keep it, it's a damn header, he, he should save it, it goes in. Can like, rides one, can he, rides yeah. two, <laughs> the, the, like, taking out. Smashing them and it's, you know, on the hang on and winning, it was just like, what a start, you know, Argentina had obviously won it in 86 and it was just incredible and then England and Ireland, Kevin Sheen well, you know scored, what? didn't he? I and think Ireland for me was a big part of it because I think that colour, seeing that colour and that, I'm trying to trying to pick my words right, but almost like a like a like a subculture because at that point, Irish people weren't seen in the greatest of light in this country. So that was like the I know we had eighty eight, we had eighty eight, and the on the on the Euros, but seeing them having a world platform and what came from that, and all these players who were seeing essentially were English were given this platform and they, they took it and they mm. you know they were done really really well with it what's been what's been like, have you spoke to Irish players about it yeah yeah um, I mean the Irish players are much easier to get hold of than the England players as you might expect yeah. uh, so I spoke to um, 
Bonner, Cascarino, uh, Kevin Sheedy, of course, Mick McCarthy, Kevin Moran, um, Colin Toybin, you know, the, the author, because he was following that World Cup for a... Did he write Rome? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> I think he did. He did Brooklyn, um, <laughs> yeah. for example. But mm. So, he, I mean, he gave me a, a different perspective on... Because we remember the the Irish adventure. You yeah. Know, yeah, the, yeah. The, the impact they made culturally was just huge. Mm. Half a million people turned out when they got... Yeah. got back and as Tony Cascarino said they didn't actually win a game in that World Cup <laughs> mm. <laughs> but but there was, a, there was a big debate going on in Ireland at the time over the way they played football yeah because you know it was Jack Charles and Ruth Warren uh, and Eamon Dunphy who was kind of the polemic figure for, for you know the Irish state broadcaster yeah. he, he was really slagging him off and, it's uh, not like Eamon Dunphy yeah. still at it today and so that, that was that was interesting for me to discover because mm. obviously at the time I just you know thought Ireland what a brilliant story but mm. I didn't realise the this whole debate was happening. Um, so the, the the Irish thing was was just as important for them as as the England story was for us. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's funny what you said before about the stadiums though. I, I felt exactly the same way. You know, seeing the the San Siro and mm. what what I, I was checking the. Just to, to put into context the the idea that we're looking at something bigger than what we're used mm. to, the, the the highest average attendance. Sorry, I've been re- <laughs> reading what? up the stats here. Highest attendance in um, eighty nine ninety was thirty nine thousand at Old Trafford. Yeah. So suddenly you're seeing these stadiums with sixty thousand, seventy thousand mm. people, and there was that wow factor, which it was it was football on a scale we didn't have, and they had all the stars, of course, in Italy. Yeah. Um, mm. And you know, of course, David Platt went there. Gazi went there. Yeah. Des Walker went there. Yeah, of well. course, yeah. yeah sure. <laughs> so um, it, it was it was an eye opening thing in Pavarotti. Um, and I spoke to somebody in terms of the, the way it influenced football. The, the people at ISL Marketing who were behind the, I suppose, creating that whole concept for Italian United, they then went and created the Champions League concept. So there's mm. a direct knock on effect. Mm. You know, so the Champions League has to have an anthem because um, Pavarotti and Pavarotti. Dome were so successful so th- th- it was interesting how you can find you know threads yeah. from one thing to one another thing. Well, it, uh, it massively and like, something about you just mentioned there about like things like computer games things like we, we just started to get like computer games then but but if you you had the logo it didn't matter how bad that particular mm-hmm. game was mm-hmm. if you've got all the official licensing off, which is a big thing coming out of that things like that I know we already had sticker books and stuff but sticker mm-hmm. books would, um, and also this World Cup the references via the like the Germany kit is, is a direct replica obviously it hasn't got the uh, the colours of the country but it's a it's a replica and it's almost like 90s has actually come back a bit. I see this because of the amount of students I see in Liverpool who were wearing like now things that but well, they might actually be the same things that I was wearing because a lot of it's like charity stuff but the where is we've just sort of come out of like the retro 80s thing we're, st- we're going into the 90s thing now and I think that that, that again is like a it shows the big cultural um, thing that it, it presented off that as well I just uh, you know and as you say I remember like AC Milan had the three Dutch players in Milan had the three German players mm. and there was all those little stories and then when you got to the you had Rudy Voller and Reichard spitting at him and all these little stories just inside just just made it. I don't I don't think I I don't think I look back on a World Cup as romantically as I look back on this one. And eighty six was my first one and although I was a lot younger and eighty six had the players from yeah. Everton playing for England and uh, again it was one of those ones where you know the commentary was coming in via via phone in some of the games and it felt very authentic. But this one was the real first one where I had the kits and I had, you know, I, the fir- England That's versus a showcase. This one, England versus Ireland, both, you know, Lineker would, had been an Everton player. Sheedy was an Everton player. There was all those little things, and uh, yeah, it's. It, I, I still, I still look back at this one as my most fondest. I remember, look, I remember seeing uh, Jenna was ground mm. with, with the the four corners with like the the brickwork in each yeah. corner, and it was like. Stadiums are amazing because that was like quite. A, you've gone from the San Siro. That's a big, big stadium yeah. to a forty thousand stadium in Genoa, and yeah. the grounds are different and everything. And like you say, the likes of Scalati who, who got his move to Juventus off the back of it, and then I don't think he scored a goal. One more one. goal he scored That's, for Italy after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah. was it. You know, stats. <laughs> but that's what he did. He, did, he got six, I think, didn't he? And he was he was absolutely brilliant in that. And 
England's journey, obviously, with the, you know struggling mm. at the start, you know two draws, mm. and then Mark Wright's header against the Egypt puts us through. We'd, we'd gone to three at the mm. back for that game, and there's all those stories mm. that come off the back of it, didn't we? The emergence of the proper emergence of Gaza in in terms of on well, that stage. I mean, you forget as well that was Gaza's only World Cup, mm. which is it's incredible. Bizarre, Everybody yeah. thought that this was going to be the launch pad mm. for this. And obviously he went to Italy going to Lazio, you know, and everyone thought it was going to be the launch pad for his career and it, it was the it was the peak of his career, that was the sad thing. It was. Um so you I mean you mentioned Cameroon, it, it, are they do you think they're the, they're the they're the country that was most affected or most influenced by this this World Cup or were there were there other stories out there that were just as just as uh, influence? Well, Cameroon was the biggest statement, I think, by by a country because they and it was a statement probably on behalf of the whole continent. Because mm. um, looking through the clippings, I, I went to, I, in the what passes for uh, national archives in Yaoundé once once had managed to disturb the two women working there from <laughs> looking at their mobile phones. Yeah, um, but all, all of their report they were kind of reporting what other African papers are saying, and they're all you know so excited. Um, so it, it sadly it. It didn't have a long-term positive mm. impact there because they. I mean, I, I went to the training ground where Thomas and Kona used to train on, and it's exactly the same. It's just red, you know, red barren yeah. uh, pitch surrounded by kind of pretty ramshackle housing. I, w- I went to another first division club and saw them training, and and they were basically getting dre- change afterwards under trees because um, th- there's, there's nothing there. There's yeah. no facilities and any money. Um, Goes ends up in the wrong pockets. Yeah. Um, the next World Cup in, for USA '94, they had a, a nationwide appeal to raise funds for the team, and they raised over a million dollars, and it went missing. Oh. You know, so you and you hear all of these stories yeah. at every World Cup. You know, you hear about the. Yeah. We always we're used to them. You know, the bonus rows. Mm. Thomas and Conard was there with with the squad in O2 before they flew to to Japan or Korea. And they were sat on a plane in Paris for I don't know eight hours negotiating. Yeah, no, but you like understand yeah, now yeah. why the players do it because yeah, they're, they're the they're the ones who are playing. They're the professionals. They're used to the way things work in Europe, mm. and they see that this money's being siphoned off. So sadly for Cameroon, it was a huge impact, but in terms of the good of the game, there it had no it had no effect. Mm, no, it could probably for the players because they gave yeah, them a stage yeah. and a platform. And you, and you still feel like with Cameroon like the influence is still there but yeah. they probably I mean I, I only look at it from like a commercial point of view with the you know the likes of the kits Puma make make the make a big deal of their kit and and they've used them actually in the last few years for like um pub you know when they had the short sleeve shirt which they could never use but it was used as it was used just as you know a, a promotional tool there was another kit which was like an all in one kit and it was like the shirt and the shorts, yeah, and they weren't yeah, allowed to. And they obviously knew they weren't allowed to. But again, they were used as a promotional tool. And you sometimes feel like, again, that's that's just another way of taking advantage of these players or that nation, because we do we do all have like this little bit of something for them. Because and it all stems from Italian ninety. Because I bet you before Italian ninety, after people wouldn't even know where Cameroon was or what it was or could name a player, and then suddenly Roger Miller becomes this player and and. I still don't know how old he is. I, I must admit, I mean, you know, he still play, played obviously in '94. God knows too, wasn't he when he so sure he scored? <laughs> well, I think the thing about Cameroon is, um, or something else about them. Howard Wilkinson did a scouting report before England played them, that said, you know, this is effectively a buy. For a England. buy, yeah. Um, be, and, and I've mentioned this to Thomas and Cohen, and he said, well, I can sort of understand this because their football was unstru- pretty unstructured. Mm. I mean, they, f- they actually they worked def- on the defence, he said, but the attacking game was just off the cuff, spontaneous. Yeah. So you never knew what you were going to get from them, um, and <laughs> I th- that's perhaps something else that's changed about football generally. Yeah. Scalacci made a similar point. He said mm. that players like me today, you you don't really see it because, like the Liverpool attack this season, brilliant, but it's it's three or four players quickly attacking together mm-hmm. isn't it on transitions whereas a penalty box sniffer you know do can do they actually sort of, can they exist today no. Uh, no. when everyone's doing pressing and so yeah. on they can't do it for, for formations can they and that's 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 an issue if, if you play I suppose mm. if you play two up front you can have one who does that and the other one will have to do 
other styles, but with with the four mm. two three one or a four three three nowadays, well, that, Cam- that's gone. That that yeah. goal scorer. Mm. Cameroon had played gone. suspended as well, didn't he, for that game against England? And, and second half, absolutely battered England. Two one up, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. Bat- come out and absolutely battered that. Bat- were battered in England, and um, ultimately that probably. The fact that they didn't take that game serious enough probably cost England in the semi-final because players were just probably so fatigued in the semi-final uh, going into extra time. So they, they took them. Uh, that scout report probably ruined it. Well, I think they battered England in more ways than one because um, another stat for you, when they played uh, Argentina, the, the, the foul count was 28-9. to nine. They, they, were, they were big fellas and they, they put yeah. it about. Um, and, I mean... Yeah, they they are pretty pretty tough. Um, but the thing is that they they that they were so unlucky against England. Mm. Uh, I think Owen Beek was clean through and trying to back heel or something yeah. at two one. Owen the, Beek, the two Owen penalties Beek. were. Uh, yeah, devious. one of them was definitely one was definitely, definitely dodgy. And they're still sore about that. I mean, Ben Massing and Kerno, Roger Miller, they were they've not forgotten. They think that they were robbed basically, mm. which was interesting to get you know other other people's perspectives mm. on our own kind of national footballing myths mm. but I, I mean England have they've never sort of had it as good because mm. for England on the flip side of that England players feel like um, if they'd beaten Germany if they'd got through that penalty shoot out they would have won it mm. and there was that general feeling and that's why I think you know when they came home everyone there, there wasn't a backlash everyone was really really positive mm. and obviously it was Gaza mania and Platt got his move to Italy off the back of it and, and, and a lot of players um, did very very well out of that but it was the same old story but it would obviously it would have been very in- interesting if Chris Wadler put that one about four inches into the uh, that below but somehow Chris Wadler I didn't know Chris Wadler said he'd never taken a penalty before or well, certainly in 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 in, in um in professional football had never taken a penalty before and you think Chris Wadler when he strikes me as a player who was well, he was a great footballer but for never to take a penalty mm. that seems very very strange mm. yeah well Gaza was meant to Gaza was down to take a penalty but obviously cried off yeah. <laughs> yeah which is all I mean that's always the thing isn't it the uh, we, Gary well, we were unlucky in that game as well you know with the goal Andreas Bremer's goal the flex loops mm. over mm. the keeper doesn't it and Lineker's goal was brilliant, so on a stye and whacked at him. Mm. But uh, Wad lit the bar, didn't he? Yeah. As well, and we had chances. He hit the post. Yeah. The post. Well. It was just so frustrating because we had them. But that was a classic case as well of a, of a team building as the tournament went yeah, on. Because yeah. we England were terrible in the group stages. I mean, Drew with Ireland, one of the. Was it 0 0 with the Egypt? Was it? No, we beat Egypt. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Mark Wright scored, Mark didn't he? Mark Wright scored. It was, the, the there was another game, it was one of the worst. Yeah, oh, yeah, it was terrible. absolutely terrible Bell, game, Bell, yeah. terrible game, and then and then obviously uh, the grew as the game went on. Belgium, well, the Belgian Platt's face after he's volleyed yeah. that mm-hmm. one in with Lineker and that way, you know. Well, I, I think the Pete Davis mentioned this to me because Pete Davis, who wrote all played out, mm. um, still the best World Cup book of all time. Yeah. Don't say that. Uh, but P- P- Pete, you know, brilliant kind of on on the ground account of that World Cup. And he said that it. Forget the fact that it was the lowest scoring World Cup and you know negative football For, in terms of drama and yeah. the storylines. Mm-hmm. I mean, in England, a, a case in point here because Belgium, the way they beat them in extra time That's with that goal, they hadn't won an extra time game since Jeff Hurst in '66. Yeah, yeah. And then to win another one in extra time, yeah. and come from behind. So, the, are they the two of the most exciting England games mm, in, probably, in, yeah. in our living memory? Yeah. I mean, I can't think of too many mm. more really. So that's why, and then you on top of that, you have our first ever penalty shootout. So you've suddenly got these three epic games. Mm. Um, mm. So forget the quality, you know, it's 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 well, that's what, strong. Stories. To be honest, mm. be, you don't football is not a game where you sit a lot of the times where you sit back and go, I wasn't that wasn't that a fantastic mm. performance. It's it it's a football or most sport is about drama mm. it's about what you remember mm. afterwards you don't sit there going well that Belgian game was actually really really terrible and England scored luckily in the last minute you think Platt and and, and, and Lineker's face as he falls onto the pile and you think about things like that you know you th- yeah, and so she felt you know you think about all those little they're the thing and that again that's why it was such a world cup but you were saying about um it was 
the last World Cup of the Eastern Bloc essentially. A lot was starting to fall. Yeah. Um, but you know, it was West Germany essentially that won the World Cup, and then straight after yeah, they, they yeah. become Germany. Um, so I mean, what are the stories that have come out of that? Because I'm sure there must be must be lots. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm just check with Lavakia. I mean, if the the Iron Curtain had begun to fall the previous October, November, December. Yeah. So you had the Czech uh, Revolution or Velvet Revolution in the November. Then in the December, Ceausescu went in Romania. The Romanians were. Uh, I went down to the. They stayed in the hotel in Cardiff. Most of that team, Champions League final before last, um, for a reunion. Could they beaten Wales in Cardiff if you remember in a qualifier for USA '94? Paul Bowden, big Paul Bowden at the bar, yeah, yeah. The penalty. Um, so they had this get together, and I went down there, and they were all reminiscing about just how their lives were just changed incredibly in in the space of those six months mm. post Ceausescu. Because they would have been playing for. Obviously, state-run teams, yeah. whether it be a uh, the army or the mm. the railway or, yeah. or or whatever, you know. So, that's what this is for the younger fans. Uh, watches, by the way. Uh, uh, yeah, they would have been playing for obviously, in the, and they, those the teams time, were in the eighties. I mean, those teams were ma- were massive. Big names. They were because yeah. they had all of the resources yeah. of a go- of of mm. their governments, yeah. so they had anything they wanted. Um, so obviously, it was a, it yeah. was a, it was a big thing. Fascinating good day. There's a real sense of, of something being lost for them because, I mean, as you say, Star Bucharest had been in two European Cup finals between 86 and 90. Apparently, there's a big flag that someone flies with, yeah. with that, so we're always reminded. And Dynamo Bucharest were in, a, I think, UEFA Cup semis like in 1990. Mm. And Dynamo Bucharest had the most players of any club in that World Cup. Mm. Unthinkable now for yeah. a Romanian club. Um, so they produced footballers mm. and they produced good footballers. And uh, their hotel, I mean, they laugh about it now, but like they lost to Ireland on penalties, and they think that if we'd actually been focused on football, we, how far could we have gone? Cause the hotel was basically a magnet for, for agents, presidents of clubs. Um, I spoke to Radu Choyu, you know, who yeah, played yeah. for West Ham for a bit. He, was, he shared a room with Lupescu, who was recently UEFA's technical director. And th- they, they went, they'd have two people, representatives from clubs, one would be on his bed talking to Andale. The other would be talking to a club in Italy, and they were negotiating kind of you know the day before these big mm. World Cup games, um, and they got their moves. But looking back now, they think that we've we've they've lost something. And the same with with Russia, because you know so- Soviet Union were, were were a force in football. Mm. You know, in '88 they'd been to the European Championship final with Lobanovsky's team, yeah, yeah. but by '90 th- it was the first time they there was no CCP on yeah, the shirts. Yeah. They had a sponsor. And sponsor leads to a row over bonuses. Yeah. So suddenly that that collective, you know, we're all in this together for Mother Russia. That that was gone. Be, yeah. And they were so. And they were, are we going to get our moves? Are we going to Italy? So they they really. It, I find it fascinating that part mm. of the book. And Yugoslavia as well. Of yeah, course. yeah. Well, I was going to say as well. You had you had with the breakup of of the Soviet Union, then you had players starting to play for other countries as well you know the Russia wasn't their country so you had all that to deal with as well they didn't even have a, f- a proper flag <laughs> you know so you can imagine you know and then someone's like well I can get you to move to it <laughs> you know do you like it here because you can stay if you want so I can imagine I that mean, look the- at that the Romanians you know the players like Georgi Hadji and Ili Dimitrescu and Pescu and Radatsoy and all of these that you're going through and you're like oh, they were fantastic and nobody Some fantastic players nobody's replaced those Okay, communism, you know, whatever the the good and bad of it. Mm. The one obvious merit was that there was a sporting structure there yeah, yeah, for yeah. everybody, and nobody's replaced that. Well, the few gangsters have taken the Brazilians have replaced the players. But I, yeah, I mean, it, it does sound stupid, but un, under that, you had you had these sporting teams at least that were money was getting put into it. I mean, really, the money should have been probably put elsewhere, like into buying people food and stuff, but. But I can imagine for a player, it was very. They were very disciplined, and they knew what they were doing. And 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 then suddenly it was a, it was a free market and a free for all. And I imagine just essentially being given whatever you wanted would be would be a big problem because a lot of those players, like players you've just been speaking of, how many of those players like went to 
got like Premier League moves and mm-hmm. they played like three or four games and you never seen them again because it was probably just the pure indulgence yeah. of what they were given that they weren't used to it and probably didn't know how to cope with it but I, you you mentioned the uh, Yugoslavia which was obviously another one that was just about to fall mm. yeah I mean I, I went to the Super Cup last summer in, in Skopje um, and I met Darko Panchev who you know a, a year Sorry. after the, that Italian IT he, he scored the winning penalty in the European Cup final mm. which was the last time a, a, an Eastern European country you know, has won it, mm. uh, won that um, European Cup, or maybe it was the only one. Um, was that Red Star? Okay, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Um, but he, and he, he, he's he's convinced that they would have, they would, they would have won a major trophy. Mm. Um, you know, be it in Euro '92 when they at the last minute they, they you know, they, that's Denmark, well, came Denmark, and yeah. the winner, didn't they? Yeah. Well, then USA '94, and of course the the Croatians look on it differently. Could they, you know, they, they're pretty nationalistic, and that yeah. that really yeah. pushed them on in France '98. Because Yarni played in Italian '90 as a young kid, and then by um, by '98, you know, he's one of the main players. Um, but yeah, they, they, there was a real. The, the, they had a brilliant league as well, you know. They had a league with you know the, the, the two Belgrade clubs, mm. Hajduk Split, mm. um, yeah. Dynamo Zagreb, yeah. and and they, it was probably one of the five or six best leagues in Europe. Mm. So th- they really, they really have this Yugo nostalgia, yeah. whatever they call it, which is understandable. Mm. Well, they were, I, I suppose they were, in, they were insulated, weren't they? They were, they were playing proper teams as well because obviously everybody had a funding source, so they was, uh, they were equal, which I suppose was what they, were, what their whole thing was supposed to be about anyway. So that that produced better players, everyone got better things, and obviously I don't know. I, I can't. Were, Yugoslavia were the labour leaders as well. The players again when you think back to them. Do you think that their their last? That they, I mean, they lost to Argentina uh, on penalties after the goalies had his leak. Um, mm. But uh, but you know that that midfield in extra time, Stojkovic, Savicevic, yeah. and um, the names. Go on, you help me, Stojkovic, Savicevic, and, and Prozanecki. Oh, oh well, Prozanecki. Prozanecki. midfield of those three players in. You know, it's the Prozanecki can play for Croatia, didn't he? After that. Mm. So who, they, sa- who yeah. said you can't play with three number tens? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's a very, very good number yeah, tens. Very good move. You know? um, I mean, another thing about it is uh, it was the last World Cup before the introduction of the Champions League. You know, you mentioned before with the anthems and all the uh, the PR around it. I mean, that was another important thing, wasn't it? All those almost gimmicks that were put into Euro '90 spread out, and then everybody sort of realised. This is the football we want to see. English football had been away, and everyone was starting. To, well, people had shied away from it, crumbling grounds and after hills. But this, it, this almost introduced a, a fresh start. This is what we wanted to look like, and it's you know with the Champions League, with the Premier League. That it's funny because what came out of ninety is almost pushed international football down the pecking order now and everything's about Champions League everything's about the Premier League and it's sort of it's eat, it's eating itself from 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 that from that World Cup yeah no it's I mean I, I was at the England uh, media day yesterday and I asked Harry Kane this question you know you're of a generation where it seems the Champions League is everything and he said no but for me the World Cup is still the big thing and I was surprised by that mm. and I don't mm. know if that's the case for every player I'm really not sure um, I'm sure they get excited when it comes along but but um, it, it's it's just some. It, it, I, I'm I'm obviously the generation where you you do think things might think some things were better then. Yeah. What's what's interesting about English football is attendances were climbing from eight, eighty six and mm. four years of climbing the football league before mm. ninety. That's because we couldn't get to see it on anyway. No, you're right. <laughs> but it, but Italian ninety was was. was it added another layer of that. I mean, it, it, it gave it extra impetus, mm. and I think I'm sure for advertisers and sponsors, yeah. they thought here's a product which is actually quite palatable now to people. Because English clubs, I think within six days at the end of Italian night, they opened the doors again to Europe for yeah. for our clubs. So yeah, um, yeah, I guess that's why we think of it as a catalyst. So and obviously stadiums were changing, the mm. seats were coming in, the standing was going, they wanted to encourage more families mm. back in and then you know come back and watch football and we'd seen this football festival that had that had been on. So it reignited almost everybody's Yeah. Not not people who were there yeah. every you know, we the hardcore yeah. who would go anyway. Yeah. But it reignited 
people who'd maybe moved away from it and, and it was the hooliganism element that died down mm. a bit and it was you know we'll make it safe for you come back and and, and that's where the attendances have gone and once it becomes Premier League and mm. Champions League and it's televised everywhere then the boom takes place then doesn't it and it's marketed in a way that it's more than just football which you have been yeah. to 1990 it then become a spectacle and you know cheerleaders and, and everything else that came off the back of it so it well, is it is pivotal I suppose the irony is the biggest losers out of all of it are, are Italy yeah they're the biggest losers out of it because mm. they lost yeah, yeah they lost all the players because of it they're, they're, they're still essentially playing in a lot of the stadiums that they're playing in now and very little's been done to it so it's funny that the country that gave us this world cup and give us you know almost just re reintroduced the love of the game i think mm. back to the world and showed what it, what it could mm. be if you presented it in the right way has uh, has dropped down the pecking mm. order somewhat because of it yeah i spoke to a burgundy you know the, the captain of that team and he yeah. he's really I mean, in, in his in his office in his home, he's got he's got it on the wall. He's got his 1982 shirt, but there's no 1990 shirt because he's still really sore about that. And he 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 just feels that it was a missed opportunity, not just because on the pitch, you know, as he said, big countries mm. won the home World Cups back then. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he also said off the pitch because they maybe they just it came just at the wrong time for them because they did their stadiums, but they did them just before the way stadium yeah. was meant to be done yeah so, so they were like doing no them. cancel either yeah. and all those kind of, a bit like Everton's main stand let's just yeah. <laughs> but you know they had for example, the problem I guess another problem was because the municipal concerns those stadiums so mm. like in, in Turin we'll have a running track because then we can use it you know for multi-purpose yeah. so they, they got it wrong and he he, he he played at the San Siro every week and he complained about the fact he hates the added tier because to us it looks superb but to them, it meant that the, the, the pitch was rubbish, mm. and he said he used to, well, he used to smell of, of damp the pitch. Um, now, of course, with you know the, yeah, uh, the yeah. hybrid pitches, it's different. But th they really feel that they that they, they missed an opportunity in Rome, for example. A couple of stations were built, which you know became these phantom stations near the Stadio Olimpico, but they were used for about thirty days, and that was it. Mm. So they think we wasted loads of money. We built stadiums like in Bari, were mm. you know down on the foot of Italy. Uh, 50 60,000 capacity and they get about 15,000 mm. so it was just it doesn't help the things th sometimes things fall into place and they just fell wrong for Italy I think that, that year in, in and henceforth it's it is it is mad the the World Cup the impact it can have on it and it can't I mean South Africa for argument's sake a lot of those stadiums are in use and they were built they were fantastic in the World Cup but the, the, the grass is nine foot I no one uses them and they were talking about the next World Cup, Russia, saying that they've moved a lot of the stadiums away from the clubs, so the clubs have got to travel 40 mm. miles. And they're playing in stadiums, that old five and 6,000, and getting that attendance to then go and play in a 45,000 mm. seater stadium miles away and going. And people are looking at it saying, well, the most we'll get is 5,000, and we've got to drive 40 mm. miles away. And that's the legacy, and you're going, you know, why is it awarded to these mm. countries? You know, put it in where there's already an infrastructure, mm -hmm. and, and but I suppose that FIFA's taking football to the world, isn't it? You know, allegedly that's what it's saying. Although England have never had it, only had it once. Mm. I think I think uh, obviously Qatar would be in the one after mm. Russia. That's going to be it's the be one, one where one, no, where there's a lot of talk of having stadiums that are, are going to be like you're going to be able to pack them up. And take them somewhere else yeah so maybe, maybe that's, that's maybe that's the answer for the future but way, yeah. um uh, any other any other any other thoughts that you want to add to this any good stories or about uh about italian 90. Mm. any interesting yeah. show i mean you mentioned cameroon what yeah. was your what was your favorite you know, yeah most interesting trip or favorite place to go i mean argentina was was pretty good because I, I met Bellardo, who was you know the coach of that team and had been told by a couple of players that he's a bit mad and he, he he's now in his late 70s and he's got a radio show every night so i met him at midnight after his show and um mm. he, he, i mean you ask him a question and 10 minutes later he's kind of meandered here there and everywhere going back to his, his studiantes days when he was kind of the, the hard man of that team which you know beat man united in the intercontinental cup uh, and basically they had a brawl you know at old trafford 
um, but he, he, Bilardo was a bit mad. Um, you know, there's some of the stuff they used to do. But apart from you know, we mentioned the bottle before. Mm. I mean, he at Maradona's wedding, he 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 didn't trust the official stats about players' heights, so he got one of his defenders, Ruggeri, to to dance with Bilardo's wife, his wife, next to Careca, because he he wanted to know how tall Careca really was. <laughs> And then, of course, about nine months later, they play um, Brazil in the World Cup, and yeah. Jerry and Marks Careca. Yeah. So, just the fact he was, you know, so <laughs> he was obsessed, uh, and you know these details that That's he brilliant. did, and and just the the, the dirty tricks Argentina got up to. I found that fascinating because they were the bad guys of the World Cup. Yeah. yeah. And, but then to hear it from their perspective, mm. and one thing which was quite kind of wistful, almost they, a lot of Coche and Goicoche, the goalie, they, they both made the point that. That team was much more loved by the Argentinian public than the Argentina team who went to the final and lost to Germany 1-0 you know, four years ago. Because yeah. those players mm. grew up in Argentina and the people could identify with them. Yeah, yeah. Now they just straight away they're off that they're off to Europe. Mm. So I think that there is a sense I know we probably have it because we're getting on a bit, but among that generation of players too, they feel that with the globalization of globalization yeah, of the game. Yeah. So, some of those connections have been lost. Have lost yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, they don't even feel like Messi's their own, do they? At no, times, yeah. so, well, some people don't anyway. Uh, and it, it, it's funny because I was just thinking back there as well. One of you saw Italy before, one of the quakes of there was playing the semi final against Argentina, but it was in Napoli. Yeah. So <laughs> after <laughs> after the squad was split, uh, after the car was split, because they, they're obviously Italian, but they wanted uh, yeah, want to Maradona to do well. Just, just finally. Obviously, it's called World in Motion. Uh, you mentioned the song at all because the song was a huge thing. It was a, yeah. it was a huge part of it because it was like a. We'd obviously had loads of cheesy mm. songs, but this was the first like it was like cool. Mm. It was cool to like this yeah. song apart from John Barnes rapping. Mm. So crap. Uh, but it was it was actually good. It was yeah. actually a really cool song. Yeah, that but I you can remember that. Yeah, of course. I mean, you're there you the back. Only because he sings it at every opportunity. That's the god. Uh, so I, I, you know, is that mentioned in the book? Yeah, yeah. I spoke to Peter Hook, who was you know the bass player, um, about the, the whole process of recording it. I mean, that's a, that's a, a brilliant story. To, he tells superbly, of course. Um, that but, but it was almost it was half written the rap when they went into the studio. Craig Johnson had come along because mm. um, he'd been involved in the Anfield rap. Yeah, um, and he was basically writing lines and feeding them as, as they went along, and all of the players, six of them, were, were turned up that day, oh, yeah. and uh, they all had to go with the rap, including Peter Beardsley, which uh, would have been. I think you've got to hold on tight <laughs> and get round the back. If that had been the B side, I think it would have sorted. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, But uh, obviously, John Barnes won the competition quite yeah. easily. You imagine. But uh, but it was funny hearing about that. And they were obviously plied them all with drink, and yeah. uh, it was a bit of a mad day. I think in the in the studio. Uh, to, so the, the making of World Emotion, I think, is is a great story in itself. Yeah, but yeah brilliant song. And it was there only only ever number one for New Orleans. So. Yeah. Uh, one one thing one story that come out of that as well is they got offered um, five grand up front. I think it was or back end royalties, mm. and they took the five grand. Dirty. And if they took the back end royalties, they'd probably all be millionaires. Because <laughs> because they only them because only them turned up. Wow. Yeah. So there you have it. Yeah. But what the day now? You know what, what I mean? What the day now? There you have it. Big thanks for Simon for coming in. World in motion. If you're excited about the World Cup as we are, and if you were excited by Italian ninety, or you just love fascinating stories about the World Cup and football in general, uh, Simon also did the brilliant Here We Go Everton book again. That's a brilliant collection of Everton stories. You know what? Go and get both. Go and get both books. So you know, sort of, you know, reading. Yeah, good bit of summer reading. You know yeah. what I mean? He's gonna, he's gotta sort out these long trips. Have you any ideas for your next book? I think I need a rest. Okay, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. You looking looking forward to the World Cup? Yeah, I'm going to uh, to Volgograd for a couple of games. So um, yeah, I'll be seeing Gilfie yeah. Sigurdsson's Iceland. So great. Mm. So I'll be starting. At the front at the front. Yeah, make sure you check out the book World in Motion. Thanks for watching Toffee TV. We'll see you later.